Hello, everybody. Welcome to Teal's Roadhouse in the house with Riley Green. Good to see you, brother. Yeah, man. Oh, appreciate you having Country me. superstar, man. Sounds Rock cool. and roll. It sounds good. Let's yeah. get on paper, don't it? It does. <laughs> from the great state of Alabama. God, why does everybody have to be from Alabama or Georgia these days? They're all from Georgia. Golly. It, it seemed like for a while there was uh, several artists. Al Dean and... Randall Gilbert and Luke Bryan, all them guys were just touring with each other, Cole Swindell, and somebody was selling merch. Next thing you know, they're opening for them. And I, I wish I'd have had that, you know what? Yeah, there's a whole lot of it going on. Yeah. Yep. Then you got to deal with all the football stuff, and then now we got to deal with Georgia. And oh God, I'm just waiting on Arkansas to show up. <laughs> you know, I can't complain too much about Georgia, uh, you know, and how they having to listen to them talk for a couple of years because we've had to do it with Alabama for a while. They've had to listen, so oh, yeah. it's only fair, I guess. Yeah, it's uh, it's just definitely a changing climate out there in the in the college football world. But it's uh, hopefully next year is going to be good. Look forward to the fall. It kind of every every year when the fall rolls around, man, when that starts to cool off and football starts, and you know hunting season's right around the corner. That's my favorite time of year when everything starts moving in that direction. Yeah, uh, you know it's 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 hard for me to take the time I want to to go get in the woods, but it's definitely uh, my favorite time of the year, just to. Be able to kind of get out there with my cell phone don't work for a little while and and disconnect, you know. Has the music business kind of taken a lot of that personal time away from you that you took for granted that you didn't realize you were going to lose? Well, yes and no. I mean, it's funny. I can remember when I first started talking to record labels, I told a buddy of mine that, you know, when I figure out what label I'm going to go with and get that deal signed, then I can kind of relax a little bit. You know, I just had no idea what that entailed, and I was so wrong about it, but... It's, uh, I've toured for several years before, you know, coming to Nashville and getting a record deal and all that. So that part was, was pretty normal. And I used to, I've still framed houses until 2018, you know, I'd work Monday through Friday and then play Friday and Saturday. So it's, uh, it's different in the sense of I'm all over now. You know, I used yeah. to was driving my truck to the shows. I could get home on Sunday and now I just kind of, when I can, I slip off, I'll keep my hunting stuff on the bus and. Uh, I kind of look at it like, man, it's, a, it's such a blessing that people are wanting to come to shows and, and listen to my music, so I need to kind of ride that out as long as I can because that's not guaranteed. Oh, without a doubt. Do, do you, uh, are you a weekend warrior? Do y'all go out? And I mean, uh, do you like do so many dates in the spring, summer? I mean, how's your, how do you structure your tour? Are you 11, 12, 11 months a year like the rest of us? I think we talked about, you know, we're going on tour with Luke Combs this year doing like 16 stadium yeah. shows and, uh, I kind of thought that'd be a slack year. I think we discussed playing a few less shows this yeah. year, you know, because of that. And it's, you know, it'd be the same. Same as always. We're just going to play. I, I can't turn anything down. Yeah, I, I, I ask that because, you know, as you get busier, especially when you're, you're, you're on a major label, you're, you're trying to write songs, you know, you're trying to get in the studio and record stuff, you're trying to drop records, and then, then you shift into promotion mode where you're hitting all the radio stations and you're doing all this. There's so much other stuff that goes on just other than the show that a lot of people don't realize. And what I've learned as I've gotten older, if I, if I want the time, i got to block it early. And if I don't block it early, then it's going to be gone that freaking quick. You'll look up and stuff in the in the – and then the fall and the winter's already booked up here in January and February. Yeah, well, I, I think what what's happened to me, and I'm sure it's, it's like this for everybody, is I'll get, uh, I won't realize how busy I am. Yeah. You know, you get in that kind of go mode and you just assume you're going to wake up and play a show somewhere, you know. And I, what's was fortunate for me, even when I first signed and went on radio tour, was I had a major tour I was on. I was touring, so I was playing Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I really didn't get to do as much of that promotion stuff. It was really kind of meeting and greeting these radio uh, PDs at my shows, you yeah. know, and it, and when I was on tour, so I kind of got to do a little bit of both, but it's, uh, like I said, it's one of those things where when I signed the deal and kind of saw what it was going to be, I just decided I was going to put my nose down and just say yes to everything for a couple of years. And that's turned into three or four now. Yeah. But when did you actually sign? I signed in 2018. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. And, and trying to survive the pandemic, man, with all that stuff going on when you're just getting your legs underneath you. How tough was that? Yeah, it was. Uh, well, you know, I won a, an ACM award for New Metal Arts of the Year in 2020. So we didn't have that award show. You know, I did a performance, but it was a, you know, a virtual or whatever you want to call it. And uh, that was tough because I, I really felt like we had a lot of momentum. I was, uh, I think it was me and Morgan Wallen and Jason Aldean on tour. And that tour ended, and I had this whole headline tour planned, you know, and, and that's right when it hit. The last show of that tour is when it got canceled. So it was real tough, but, I, you know, at the same time, it, it hurt everybody. You know, there's nobody in the music industry that really thrived through that kind of stuff. So it was, uh, it was tough, but it seems like the fans are, you know, even more so 
ready to get out and have normal again and come to these shows. So the last year or so has been great. Yeah, I think uh, when everybody got back out, it's like they were almost rabid. <laughs> it's like uh, yeah. it was a little bit, a uh, little bit rowdier. But but ticket sales were tremendous, man. It everybody was seems, uh, especially the huge festivals, man. The numbers with Live Nation, and I mean, it's just been unbelievable how many folks have been coming out. It's crazy. Yeah, it was awesome. You could you could tell there was a lot of excitement too. But I mean. You know, it's uh, you see that with everything. I think I had a buddy that's got a boat dealership, and he couldn't keep boats on the because yeah. there was people were going out, people were getting into hunting, people were you know. I think the uh, some of the conservation numbers of turkey hunters from the last year in the state of Tennessee was like blew up, you know. So it's uh, it was a, a really strange time, but for me, not really living in Nashville. You know, you almost could forget it was going on. I mean, my grandmother still went to Walmart every day, and you know, outside of a absolute downtown Nashville, I mean, as you got outside of Davidson County, things were fairly normal. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had a couple of bad months, but as we got kind of into July that year, I mean, the gyms were open back up, and she, uh, the only place I go is Lowe's, the grocery store, and tractor supply. That's about it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's my world that I live in, and all that was open. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, like I said in small town America, you didn't see it near as much, but it was. Uh, the a blessing that came out of it for me was I got to hunt a lot. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, I think I hunted 25 days in the state of Kansas. You know, and I was from September 1st to February 2nd. I don't think I spent five days at home. I was gone. But it's, uh, it, that's kind of how my, I guess what you would call my regular life is, is just kind of fit it in around what we're doing. Because it's, it's so awesome to be playing shows and to be out in front of fans. And like I said, I can't rationalize after framing houses my whole life taking a day off from going and singing country songs. That's a pretty cool way to make a living. Yeah, I did my fair share of construction work, man. It seems to kind of go with the water around here, man. I did a lot of it coming up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I uh, base my success in country music off of how much I forget about building houses. I hope one day I, I don't know how to read a tape measure. I know I've made it. That's my goal. <laughs> yeah, you'll never forget that. That'll stay with you forever. What's, uh, what's going on musically with you, brother? Uh, so I've got a, a single coming out uh, this spring, uh, going to country radio. I've kind of, you know, haven't had a single at radio for a while I, other than Thomas Rhett's single, which yeah. was uh, awesome for me to get to kind of ride his coattails on one. That was a, a really fun song, and it did really well. So uh, coming out with my single and really just having the time to get in the studio, I think something I've struggled with is being so busy. You know, you write when you can. You kind of, you know, get to the studio if you got a day or two and you cut three or four songs. And what happens is you don't have that, what I would say, full album type of project. Everybody's putting out EPs or singles, and it's it's all changed a lot. But I really wanted to go spend just, you know, uh, three or four days in the studio and yeah, this song, see if it flushes out to be what I think it is, or this one, and kind of narrow stuff down instead of just going and saying, "Here to these studio musicians, here's my four songs. Let's go cut these," and really kind of dive into the music side of things. Because I, as much as it sounds crazy, I think when you are on the road as much as you are, I think that's the only thing that really suffers a whole lot. It's creatively for me, I mean, you know, I, I play three or four shows a week and then I put my guitar down and don't want to look at it again until I got to on Thursday, you know. So yeah, I don't it, write like I want to, like it, I should. Do you, do you find it hard to write on the road? I, I don't write as well on the road, that's for sure. But, I mean, you know, at the same time, I wasn't a big fan of the, like, structured rides, like co-writing and going and setting the date and all this stuff. I probably missed a lot of them when I started out, but I've gotten used to it now and obviously – it's nice to have that accountability of somebody going, hey, you're going to write this day. That, and that's kind of what I need now. But that was uh, something about having time off, like over the holidays or even in 2020 of just being home and, you know, you, you hadn't played in a while. You kind of miss it. You want to get up and start picking an old song and then start writing. So I think some of my better songs come out of like this accidental, you know, sitting around picking a guitar, at least best ideas. But yeah. Uh, I, don't, I, I haven't really just got right on the road dialed in yet, you know, but I think taking some guys out and getting a little more room and a more structured tour, you know, I, I think in the last few years it's kind of been, I'll go play a club here and then I'll go out and open for, you know, Dirks Bentley. So The bad thing about trying to ride on the road, it cuts into your golf time too. I mean, it really does. <laughs> Sleeping cuts into my golf time. Uh, I, I've gotten, uh, I, I grew up golfing. My granddad was a golfer and really enjoyed it and, you know, I played three other sports in high school, baseball. They said that was all bad for your swing, so I quit playing, and I picked it back up. And there's something about that on the road, getting out and, you know, just getting on a course and riding around. That's the best way to just get away from everything. So I'm I'm definitely getting back into it now. Well, it's kind of like riding around on back roads when we were growing up. You get to ride around on a golf cart and drink beer. It's hard to beat that, man. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes they let you do it for free. No kidding. You give them tickets to the show. Pretty awesome, yeah. isn't it? 
get what's your what's your musical background? I mean, did did you come from a musical family? Brothers, sisters, all that good stuff. Uh, my, my oldest sister, Lindy's a really good singer. Uh, my sister Casey can sing a little bit, but I I mean, I wouldn't have. I, I never would have called myself a musician or a singer. You know, I I can remember when I was a kid, my mom would made me be in Kitty Stone Singers, which was a like elementary school, and I thought there's no way I'm doing that. You know, and uh, I just didn't like singing in front of people. I didn't think I was a good singer, and uh, I guess when I was like 11 or 12, my granddaddy Buford, who was a big fan of music, I always say he kind of taught me how to play guitar, but he didn't know how to play. Like he just had an old guitar and we'd sit around and, you know, try to figure out old songs and he kind of played the harmonica a little bit. And we used to go down to my great grandparents' house and sit on the porch and just, you know, try to sing old, like, I'm, I'm talking about like Roy Acuff stuff, yeah. like old stuff, you know, I'm a kid. And uh, he'd like, call my grandmother and see if she'd bring the yellow pages down and see if so-and-so that he used to know played the banjo was still alive. And he'd call up some more. And we started doing that every week. And it eventually turned into every Friday we'd meet on the porch and play. And people started to come listen. So we have a sawmill out there. We painted a big saw blade gold, put it on the front porch, and we called it the Golden Saw Music Hall. My dad and his brother and me tore the floor up and built a little stage. And we started doing that every week. And it became a thing. It was At one point in time, it was 250, 300 no kidding. older people out there come every week, and it, it was free. The old ladies brought snacks. Everybody got to play. I mean, there was probably 15 pickers on the stage, and that was how I learned how to play was just watching them make those three chords, you know, how they – and, you know, those old songs like that are real easy, and, and it was easy to pick up, but that was probably how I got into singing was yeah. – I would never have gotten up in front of somebody, but me being a little kid, getting in front of all those old people, they'd cheer like crazy. My granddad slipped me ten dollars if I'd sing with him, you know. And he was awful, so it kind of made me sound better. And uh, so my background was very much from uh, like you know Merle Haggard, George Jones. My granddad loved Roy Acuff, and I think he used to sing uh, "Wreck on the Highway" was his his song, you know. But you know that was really I never thought it was anything that I'd end up doing more than just that was kind of how I spent my time with him. My granddad Lyndon was a golfer bass fisherman, a hunter, and that's what we did. But I'd go to my granddad Buford's house, we'd sit around and play, you know. So yeah, that's a very interesting uh introduction to music. You know, I don't think you hear that much anymore. Nowadays everybody's growing up doing karaoke or you know, but but really that foundation is kind of rare these days. You know, it, it took me a long time to realize that too, because you know, I, when I signed a record deal, the label came down to Alabama where I'm from and they wanted to film like a where you're from piece to give to PDs and kind of introduce me to country radio and I, I just remember everybody in the label just being like, this is real. You know, there's one flash of like light. Mayberry. There's, there's one store. It's called Green Store. And the old guys meet in the morning, play dominoes for work. You know, like, and it, and it really is like that. So growing up around it, you don't realize how rare it is to see something like that. And I think I was in college before I really, like, started taking people out to the music hall. You know, playing three sports, I didn't really get into the music thing. But that was kind of my... Uh, you know, my connection with my granddaddy. So I started taking people out there on Friday nights and they were like, oh my gosh, like, what is this place, you know? And so, it's, so when did the switch flip and you and you said, I'm going to think I'm going to make a, make a run at this and see what kind of life I can make. And they started making. paying me. I mean, but, I mean, <laughs> when did you think about coming to Nashville? I mean, when did all that I, So I, I didn't. I, I was really backwards about it. I, so I started, uh, let's see, I played a little ball in college and, and amongst that time I started playing in a band uh, I play lead guitar in a band, and uh, gotcha. you know, I, I, I people would ask me to sing some songs that I'd written. I sang a couple of songs in the show, started to become more, started to get some gigs around town. So I think for about four or five years, I just played every Thursday, Friday, Saturday within about a county radius at every Mexican restaurant and bar there was, and it was really more of a like from my hometown. You know, played quarterback in college there, like I knew everybody, and everybody came out because it was gonna be a good time. I didn't assume I was good. I just, people just knew it was going to be a good time. They could drink on my tab, you know. And uh, I guess I started writing, and that was where I found, like, a passion for it. I, it's something that I came up with that people were requesting, you know, because I, I wasn't the best singer. I, I sure there was guys waiting in line behind me to sing cover songs that could blow me away. I just, when I realized I could get a fan from something that I came up with, uh, I think the first time I ever really realized it, I opened for Marshall Tucker Band in Anniston, Alabama. Wow. And uh, I sang a song I wrote called Bury Me in Dixie, and people just went crazy, you know. And I was like, man, that's, that's wild to think that people really related to that song. And so I started doing that and, you know, scrape together a little money and record here and there. And it was, I don't, I don't even know who told me you could put music on, like, a thing called CD Baby, and it put it on, like, Amazon. I don't even know if Spotify was a thing then, but I just had music out that I didn't realize it. And I remember a guy called me from Birmingham 
place called Iron City. It's like a 1300 cat room. And uh I said, man, I keep hearing your name. You come play. And I was like, dude, there's no, it's going to be empty, you know. Anyway, I finally talked me into it. And we sold 1,260 tickets. I mean, I didn't have a band. I was just calling up guys I thought could play. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just, that's how it happened for me was I just didn't even know I had a following. But I'd put this music out and people were, were getting it. So labels eventually, you know, two, three years later started coming down to my shows. Like I was making enough noise on the road that touring is really what drove me to get a record deal. That's really awesome. Man. I'm telling you, it doesn't really happen that way a lot. It no. Doesn't. I mean, there's people that come. I've, I've got some friends, great singer-songwriters that have been here, signed to major labels, put on a shelf, locked up till past their prime. I mean, I've seen it happen over and over again. So that's a, that's a, good, that's a good entry level to be able to get in and do what you've done. Yeah, I think it's such a tough battle, especially as a new artist, to, to maybe have a song that is a hit and people not really know who sings it. I think there's a difference between somebody that's a fan of a song and a fan of an artist. And I think that's such a tough thing as a new artist to get over that hump. You know, you have a couple of hits and people sing along when they play it and they sing it when, you, when you're at a festival. And you, But really going, oh, that's so-and-so. You know, and I think for me, what helped me get that was having a fan base before him, but also trying to have a thing. You know, I mean, like what type of songs I sing, what type of songs I put out, this this familiar enough to people where they're going, oh, that's a Riley Green song. You know, that's what I try to do anyway. Uh, I mean, when you say that, I mean, what what is your, what are you looking for as far as an outside song or something? Are you looking for Love Gone Wrong? Are you, I mean, are you looking for drinking songs? Has that that approach changed as you've gone through a couple of album projects? I mean, how do you how do you look at the material that you're, that, I mean, what are you looking yeah, for as an artist? What, what? I probably don't pay enough attention to the type of song. I can tell you how many times, and you know better than me, if you go in with the songwriter and they go, what do you want to write today? Like, what kind of song? I'm like, oh, just a good song, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm nowhere near against cutting outside songs. I, I wish somebody would send me paint me a Birmingham right now. You know, like but at the same time I'm picky about what I cut in the sense of I want it to be really me. And you know, I you can't blame any songwriter for writing towards the charts, writing towards what's working. Because that's you know, how do you not do that? Even as a new artist, you come in town and go, Man, that guy's doing really good. I need to do that. So it's so hard to have blinders on in this town. So I think a lot of my, I guess my goal to have something original is to, to go home as much as I can, spend my time there. That's where all my inspiration came from that wrote the songs that got me where I am. Yeah. And uh, just keep that mindset of, you know, what is it that made so-and-so like this song, this this fan? How did I get this fan? You know, I, when I started writing, I, I never thought I'd have a deal, song on the radio, nothing. So I just wrote because I thought they'd like it on Friday when I played at that bar. And then I'd play it, and I'd go, oh, they, they did like this line. And then the next time I wrote, so I let fans really shape my writing for a long time. Yeah. And so I'm trying to get back to that. That's what I try to do. So I think playing shows is a huge part of it, and I that was one thing that hurt me so much in 2020 was not being out and getting to bounce things off of fans. Luckily, we have social media and the ability to do these virtual Zooms and Skypes and all this stuff, but still, just that reaction from something you play and how you play it is probably my biggest asset and writing songs do you find that that's gotten harder to gauge as the crowds have gotten bigger definitely well you know it's it's such a double-edged sword because you know the opportunity to go like i went out with luke bryan for 36 dates i think last year it's awesome luke's great yeah. the shows are great i'm a little spoiled because i have headlined some of the same venues we played you know like so it was a. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have a fan base, e even though it's nowhere near what Luke Bryan's is. You always want to play for your fans. So, you know, that that give and take of going to try to get new fans and, you know, basically exposure for yourself and then, you know, going and getting that real feedback. So I think booking my own shows in amongst the tour is very helpful, but the crowds get bigger. You're playing a festival, and, yeah, you've got your fans there, but I always say mine are the broke college kids in the back in the grass anyway. You know, the big Luke Bryan fans, they're right in the front. They paid the high dollar ticket. So it's uh, it's tough. And it, it's I'm looking forward to these shows I have prior to this Luke Combs tour to really, you know, I'm, I'm going to play some clubs. You know, just to Clubs are always fun to go back to at least a little bit at a time, man. I mean, I, I think I, I still like to go back and play them periodically too. Not all the time, but you know, it, they they do have their purpose, and they're a lot of fun having those people right up on oh, top yeah. of me and getting that instant feedback from them. That's, I mean, I still I still long for that. Well, I think that maybe whereas even I've struggled and some people struggle to play bigger on a bigger stage. 
I think it's the same thing if you don't do it the other way. It's like you can you can forget how to go do that thing where you're right there. Oh, yeah. You know, like what I'll call a coffee shop show where you go in there and nobody's there to listen to you and you got to win some of them over. I mean, that was how I got where I could play. Was going Sing Smelly Cat, man. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They, just, <laughs> they don't boo you out of there, you know? So, I mean, I want to, uh, you mentioned college several times. What, what was your major back in college? <laughs> football. Football for a little bit. <laughs> But uh, uh, did uh, were you good in literature? I mean, where did the songwriting? I was on the structure? verge of illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, had to have some kind of skill, man. Come on, that's, that's fine. That's nice, you had to learn that's something. nice of you to say. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I think my problem in college it wasn't that I was a horrible student. I just didn't go to class. My first semester, I passed 16 hours. It's no problem. A's and B's, like, but they had coaches checking your classes, and they'd walk by the glass door and look in there and write, and you'd go to the running list on Wednesday morning if you weren't there. And then after that first semester, they were like, oh, you're good, man. You know, you don't have to go to tutor anymore. We're not going to check your classes. And I wasn't good. They they needed to. Yeah, the wheels My, came my accountability was not there. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I, I didn't hate school. I just, I kind of had that mentality of, you know, I spent my, all my summers working with my dad. I you know, I had a little tile and flooring business when I was in college. I did a little bit of that and did some framing. and had another crew I worked with. So I was kind of like, man, if I can go make money and, you know, I'm not going to get signed by the Cowboys. You know, I was thinking I could just grow a long gray ponytail and play country music on the weekends and work during the week. I was going to be rich. Didn't have any kids, no wife, no car payment, you know. So uh, it just it just wasn't something I was motivated to finish. I didn't, I didn't have a desire. I had no idea what major I was going to go with or where I was going to end up from it, you know. So, but did you... Did you learn structure and all that stuff for songs just by listening to songs and writing lyrics out and kind of studying what you were passionate about is what you were doing? I wouldn't use the word studying at all. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think uh, one of my one of my first songs that, that people seemed to like was a song I wrote called Almost, and the chorus was different in every at three different courses, you know, which is a no no when you're you know thinking about writing yeah. songs. But I mean, at the same time, there was something that that was cool about that to me in the sense of like. Chris Knight. You know, like, I like the kind of stuff that just doesn't always look the way it should. Not some cut and dry, here's the two courses and the, you know, so I didn't have any idea what I was doing, but sometimes there's there's something about that. I, I still think that a lot of my most popular music is really rough, broken down, acoustic type stuff. You know, I think, I mean, yeah. that's one of the biggest moments of my shows when I come out with a guitar and a stool. So, you know, it's it's a weird time, but I think that Something about that is different to people, and I think that's probably the best thing you can be today with as many avenues to get music out and as many ways for people to go find new artists is to be different, have a thing that's a little different than everybody else. Yeah. You remember when uh, your first single hit the top of the charts? Yeah. Uh, how life, how life-changing was that for you? It was crazy. I mean, I can remember being on tour, and, and, you know, I was on a headline tour. I think I was like Maryland or somewhere, and it broke the top 20. And I can remember that's when people started really singing it louder. And then the stuff I'd put out before on my own, you know, I started to say, oh, man, like this is, you know, a big song. And then, of course, it keeps going. It makes it number one. And it was like, it was it was weird. It felt like to me, like, I didn't do enough work for that song to be as popular as it was. You know, like it was, it was people had heard it. I didn't go play all these places and they knew it. You know, I'd never been to so-and-so Wisconsin and they were singing it there. So it was crazy to see how that, train of radio can really push something to a completely different level but it was uh it was cool i've had a lot of moments like that that i think i didn't really fully comprehend just because there was so much going on i mean i never thought i'd be on a major tour and i was out with brad paisley you know yeah. i think that was huge for me you know and had a number one and i i wrote uh I remember I wrote, I wish grandpa's never died while I was on that tour. I just had number one and, and I saw a video of Brad Paisley singing it on his Instagram, like just playing. I thought, what the heck is going on? And played the Grand Ole Opry. That was such a huge deal and all these things. So a lot of uh, accolades that were huge for me, but really tough to comprehend at the time, you know. Yeah, it gets a little overwhelming. And there's something about feeling the the wave of a record that's going up the charts. You can, there's stages to it, you know? It's, it's cool when it cracks the top 40, but you really, like you said, you really don't feel, you don't feel the feedback from the fans till it gets to top 20. And then when it hits top 10, it gets a little bit more intense and top five a little bit more intense. And then when you get done, it's like trying to process all of it. And then, Let's do it again. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, no, it's yeah. like you, one's never enough. Once you have one, you got to have a whole bunch more. That that ride's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, man. It's it's uh like I said, it's something that with with any success I had, I can't duplicate because that's 
that's so pushed on such a big scale. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's probably can be a little stressful if you pay too much attention to it. I try not to, I try to, you know, they, they'll give me my updates and my email from the label and tell me it's this, this, whatever. But, uh, it's really enjoyable to watch it happen out there. You, I promise you, there'll be a point when you look back on it when you're really able to process it. Because when you're when you're doing all this stuff, and you know, it just gets uh, you just kind of get blinders on, and you just get out there and do your thing. Being able to look back on it after after twenty or so years and really process, I say this all the time for every one of us that are blessed enough to have a career in this business. Thousands of kids out there dreaming the dream that it never happens for. For whatever reason, maybe the talent wasn't there, maybe uh, wrong place at the wrong time, a couple of bad decisions. But it's a, it's a pretty awesome thing to be a part of it, isn't it? No doubt, and I and I can honestly say it's it's very helpful for me to have never thought in a million years that I would have had a record deal or song on the radio or anything. So it's 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 kind of like a little bit relaxing. You know, like I've already done way more with my career than I thought I was. So it's kind of like if if I never have another uh, song that comes out that does anything, it was pretty great. But it's it's really fun to watch it build, and it's motivating. It makes you want to go write better songs and play more shows. And uh, you know, that it's w with all the charts and all the things that can happen for you, the fans and the reaction from the shows. What I think never gets old about it. There's a lot of monotonous things in this industry, which is the travel and going yeah. to do this, doing the same thing over and over again or interviews or whatever, but podcasts all the time, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's awesome to go and, and, and play the show. That's something I tell people all the time. It's not hard about this job. That's something that's fun. What's your, uh, what's your day routine like on the road? I sleep till I got to get up. <laughs> me too. <laughs> until, until, until they make me get up. I yeah, sleep, that's yeah. what Derek does. I too. sleep till noon every day if I can. Man, you know, yeah. my, my dad, when I was like, I quit playing ball, so I wasn't in college, and I was like, I guess I didn't really need a lot of money, but I was I was playing some shows and working a little bit, and he, he killed me. He, he wakes up at 5 o'clock every morning and, and like would build a snowman if he was too, <laughs> like he just anything. He can't sit still. And, uh, it just used to eat him alive that I would sleep all day. And he'd come and like, man, you're wasting your life. Like, you don't understand how much enjoyment I get out of sleeping. Like, that's not a wasted and life. And staying up all night. I was going to say, if you stay up till four and you don't, you know, I'm gonna you, tell you, you this... go to bed to four and then you sleep till noon, that's a solid eight hours. No doubt. <laughs> What's everybody complaining about? <laughs> my work day starts at 8 to 10 p.m. Y'all starts at 8 a.m. That's not my fault, all right? <laughs> yeah. And if I can get done at what I need to from 2 p.m. on, you know, what does it matter when I get up? <laughs> Uh, this is a true story. I mean, when I when I at that time period, I was out of college and just kind of goofing off. I used to set an alarm for six o'clock in the morning every day, just so I could wake up and get that feeling of going back to sleep. You know, like because you're never more tired than when you have to get up in the oh, morning. Oh yeah. And I'm just like wake up and be like, oh my gosh, I I don't got to go anywhere. It was great. And I'm, and I'm telling you, rolling down the road on the bus, you you do sleep good on the bus. And you're, you you said you're getting ready to get a new bus. Have you have you had become accustomed to the back lounge yet? As far as sleeping in the back yet? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah so I, it, I didn't take much getting used to. It, 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 it makes a big difference, but you still really don't go to sleep till the bus stops. There's something about that. And then when you get there in the morning, then it's like you die for a few hours. I, you know, I was one of those. That I think I was like one of the first of my buddies to turn 16. So I drove everywhere. And I got to the point where I couldn't ride. You know, like I got buddies that'll pull up in their truck and they'll just get out, get in the passenger seat, and I'll get in and drive. Like I drove everywhere. And I and it really kind of get motion sick driving. You know, I, I had never flown before I signed a record deal. And uh, so when I got on a bus, I was just like worried. And it was like for a little while, I was like on a boat, you know. But I think you just got tired enough. Got to get your bus legs, man. Yeah. That's what it's all yeah. about. I uh, drank till I got them. I think you get tired <laughs> enough, you'll sleep. You know? Absolutely. What? Uh, what's? Uh, are there any cities that you've been to that that still intimidated you? I mean, if you had, to, if you didn't fly till you got a record deal, I mean, what was New York like first time for you? I, I was claustrophobic. It's overwhelming. Yeah, I, I spent a few days up there. We did like the good mornings and hello and todays and all that stuff, and you know what I'm talking about the shows. Uh, yeah. Regis and Kelly, and. Uh, it was like, I was in a hotel. First off, it was a nice hotel, but the room was tiny. And, like, the bathroom was like, I was, like, showering and, like, brushing my teeth at the same time. And I just remember, like, looking out and not be able to see past the buildings made me feel so, like, claustrophobic. Like shut in. Really. It really did. I mean, of course, Nashville did that to me for a little while. I had a condo in Nashville, and I kind of felt like, but New York was a whole other level. I can at least see outside of Nashville. You know, back in the day when I, things are different now, but when I first got my record deal in the 90s, I got signed in, in May of 91. Uh, 
Sticks and Stones went number one in January of 92. Back then, we did showcases. So I had four of them. I had one in Marina Del Rey, one in Atlanta, one in Dallas, and one in New York. I just happened to be in New York when it went number one. So they they would rent out. We, we played our showcase at the Radio City Music Hall. So they brought all the radio people to us, PDs, music directors, everything. Had a couple of other acts from the label, and they pay for everything. So they have put us up at a big five-star hotel and all that. When we got done at the, uh, at the Radio City Music Hall on that Saturday night, we went back to the hotel. Well, all the label people and everybody left. They left us in this five star hotel with the tab open. I started I off. They the, won't make that mistake again. I started off at the bar. That was about a grand. And then by the time we finished clearing the five star restaurant out, I had the waiters holding trays of oysters. I bought 18 bottles of Dom Perignon and sent the bill to the label, baby. They were so mad at me. That's, that's, that's when you forgot what recoupable <laughs> means. I'm paying for it anyway. Yeah, I, was, I just had a number one record. I didn't yeah, care. I wouldn't care. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a it's a very interesting journey to say the least. That's probably one of the best things about being on the road, like like we are. Is I never had any time to spend any money. Yeah, you know. So I mean, obviously, I was doing pretty well and and touring and happy about the opportunities I had. But I was like, man, what am I going to buy? I want to buy here a new truck. Like, and I can't boat. fit it on the bus. I can't take it nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, you'll find plenty of stuff to spend your money on. I promise. There'll be some woman that comes along and gets half of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just going to bury half. <laughs> oh, man. So, you in a relationship? I'm trying, man. Uh, I'm yeah. trying, yeah. I've, I've dated a girl for a good while now, and it's such a tough lifestyle. It's hard on me. I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't, I don't stay in touch with friends and family like I should. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just hard with, with what's going on, and you know, you're, you're physically going to be so disconnected from everything going on in a certain place, and really mentally you kind of got to be where you're at you know for at least an extent of the time so it's a tough thing to do i don't i'm not a big cell phone guy i'm not a big you know i don't know if i even know how to check an email so i i got to work on that but that's that's probably the biggest uh, problem for me is the lack of communication uh that's that's what i've seemed to struggle with they don't they don't like that did you uh, how how much has your career in radio success affected your family, brothers and sisters and stuff? I, I mean, it's did it you, you big know, impact on them pretty hard? Yeah, I mean, obviously, they're all super proud of me. You know, I can remember uh, my two of my grandmothers and one of my granddaddies was alive when I played the Grand Ole Opry, and that's when I was famous. I mean, I already had number ones and maybe an ACM award, whatever, but when I played the Grand Ole Opry, that was, that was the big deal. But, you know, like, I go home and my Uncle Wayne... So my grandmother, little Jean's brother, he just, all he does every day is uh, he rides to the store, goes to the Huddle House, he goes and sees all of his buddies in the hospital that are, you know, or in the nursing home, and then he comes by my house and just, he's there for 15 seconds. How's everything going? Good to see you, and leaves. He just rides around all day. But he still tells me, like, you know, the lady at Waffle House, uh, you know, her daughter listens to you. Like that's that's <laughs> that's how big it is, you know. I mean, I can remember coming home and telling my mom I signed a record deal with Big Machine, and she said, "Oh, that's great. You want mashed potatoes?" She's just like, "Fix, you don't, you know." Yeah. And my dad's like, "I thought you signed a record deal last week with Warner or something." I was like, "No, that was a publishing deal." He's like, "What's the difference?" I'm like, "Hell, I don't know," <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I mean, there's been obviously feats, and you know, you go on a big tour. I'm sure me doing podcasts with you is going to be hugely popular back home, you know. Yeah, with all, all the rednecks. <laughs> That's what I we tell, are. <laughs> I tell you, man, I, I didn't, I never thought about it, but, uh, and and you probably won't fall in that you write most of your stuff, but there was one, I cut Time Marches on, and I, ne I never thought about what impact that would have on my dad. Everybody started thinking that I wrote that song and that my dad was having an affair on my mother. I mean, and he had to answer questions about that everywhere he went. So, Daddy's got a girlfriend in another, another town, does he? I never took any of that into consideration, but it does affect them. Yeah, I, I wrote a I wrote a song about my granddaddy Linda and having Alzheimer's, uh, and he was a big NASCAR fan, which he didn't. His brother did. You know, I mean, that's how I came up with the idea for the yeah. song. I remember seeing his brother and things he was going through, and me and my granddaddy were fishing on Lake Gunnersville one night. He liked to go spend the night on the boat and sleep out there, and I was sitting there, and he was like, "Reach over there in that." third drawer on the left of the tackle box, get that blue spinner bait with a yellow tail on it out, like in pitch black dark. I'm like, he'll never forget that. He knows where everything is in his tackle box. He knows who drives what car, and that's what the song was about. So I wrote that one about him, and he was still living, you know, and, you know, he heard the song, and he's, you know, kind of confused about it or whatever. And so it's uh, it's kind of odd when you, you know, because 
I write a lot of stuff from personal experience, but it's not all exactly how it was, you know? Yeah. So when you put somebody in your family and stuff like that, I can see, especially when it lives in a place like where time marches on does, you know? Yeah. But, you know, you just don't take a lot of that stuff in consideration. As I've gotten older, it doesn't bother me like it did, but it's uh, it was a little overwhelming at times. You know? I, I played uh, I played the Opry, and my, like I said, my grandmother's, my granddaddy was there, and I played that song. And so, and my granddad didn't hear real well at the time. So I, and I was like, just explaining the song to the, to the fans. I said, and my granddad's even here. And he stood up, like he thought I was like calling. <laughs> and he stood up and just like, but he, but he had a look on his face like he didn't know where he was. So it, it really worked out. Late, late in the song, great. You know, I think I got a stand innovation with him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's talk. I, I want to go down some rabbit holes, man. I, so you don't, you don't uh, search down rabbit holes at all. I mean, any any crazy stuff that you as a world flat or anything like that? <laughs> no, and I I've always struggled to to like people that are very opinionated just because it seems like they think they're smarter than everybody else. Yeah, especially if I don't agree with them. But uh, I've always kind of tried to err on that side of I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I, if if you know, I, I saw somebody talking about the doing something on their socials about the moon was smaller was bigger than the sun or whatever this kind of thing. I'm just like. I don't ever want to look like that. <laughs> it may be right. I don't know. I just I'm, there's a lot of people thinking about it a lot more than I am. Well, I don't know. I got all kinds of crazy stuff I go down. What do you think about it, boys? Ask some questions. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I've been. This has been uh, on my mind since you since you mentioned it. Uh, the golden chainsaw. Do you still have it? <laughs> the golden saw, yeah. The golden saw, yeah, yeah. So in 2020, we did a, a thing called the Golden Saw series where I brought some songwriters down. And, you know, just to, to have something going on with fans, we did it uh, uh, like a, a YouTube series, I guess is what it was. And uh, so I'd have, you know, guys that wrote hit songs for these other artists, and they'd play and tell the story about it. And we just have like 30 or 40 people there to watch. And it, I mean, it turned out awesome, I thought. It's been a really cool thing. So, so you have the saw itself? Yeah, the saw's still on the side of the... That. Yeah, it was my great-grandparents' house. The saw's still up on the side of the building. Yeah, hung up. You might have to name your new bus that same thing or something. That's... that's <laughs> Something cool about That's it. That's not a bad idea. I, of course, it might be dangerous to have a saw blade strapped on the side of the bus because <laughs> the thing pops off and rolls down the interstate. It'd be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, man you came down to uh, Waynesboro last summer, <clears throat> and you were just talking about relationships and all that mess. So my ex and I, she's a damn good woman, by the way. Let's, let's, oh, that's let's, not what you said about her last night. That's not true. <laughs> but uh, we went there, and uh, man, it was a little podunk town, Waynesboro, and it was a little uh, county fair, not fair, uh, park, but... I sit there and I always, I don't go to shows that often. I go to maybe one or two that I try to go to because we always play shows all the time. So, yeah. But I sit there and I analyze every single thing about it. And the show was incredible. And you mentioned the acoustic part of your show. Dude, that's, that, was, that was the highlight of the show for me. And, and everybody appreciated it so much for you to come down to such a small little town like that. I mean, everybody in the community was there. There wasn't supposed to be no drinking, but everybody that had cups had alcohol and i didn't know to i didn't get that memo no <laughs> <laughs> but the show was still great and i was 100 percent sober it, it was it was awesome man we appreciate you coming down there well that's the biggest compliment you're sober and the show was great <laughs> yeah, it, it was awesome. well that's a rarity in itself yeah, isn't it? I, I didn't even know my girlfriend could run until you come off the stage and then she ran up there to get a picture <laughs> <laughs> that's not why she's your ex is it <laughs> oh no 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 it's because i'm gone all the time the lack of communication there that's you the go that's tough. She... <laughs> that's tough man so what's your what do you warm up to? What's your go to guy? You mentioned Haggard earlier. I mean, what's the, what's the stuff that you uh, kind of revert back to? I, w I was in the uh, the generation of like burnt CD, so it was like I'd have a Time Marches on, and then I'd have like a you know Tupac or something on there. It was just like, this wide variety of stuff yeah. that we listened to. And I had a sister that was ten years older than me, and she was like sublime and weezer and you know all that 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 kind of 90s rock and uh then my sister casey she was like you know a real like country like tracy lawrence tim mcgraw like that era you know and my dad was like leonard skinner the band i loved the band growing up i was a big fan of levon helm and i think my mom was like fleetwood mac and mom was in the papas so yeah i had a lot of stuff going on you know and then i'm out here hanging with my granddaddy singing roy acuff song so uh i've always kind of liked about any kind of music, I think that at a certain point in my life, I got really drawn to the storytelling of country music. That was what I loved about it so much. And, uh, you know, it, when I sit down and, and try to write a song, I think I go towards that, like, heartbreak. You know, I think if I had my way, everything would be just sad and crying all the time. Me too. Road. But that's, you know, that's yeah. the kind of songs I'm, I just that's naturally That's what I sing my write. teeth into. I, that, to me, is, is hardcore country music. 
Yeah, and you know everybody didn't want to ride around crowd days. You got to have some fun, you know, drinking songs and that kind of stuff. But I think that's that's what what drew me to country music to begin with, and really keeps me motivated to ride. Yeah, I like all that old stuff too, man. I just, I'm just curious about everybody's musical influences, man. It's I, I don't think anybody's coming into this format these days with just a traditional country approach, man. We listened to everything growing up. I mean, for us, it was all the way back to the hair bands of the '80s, and you know, Led Zeppelin and Van Halen and all that stuff. I mean, all those bands were huge influences. I just didn't have the the voice to sing that stuff, or I might have yeah. gone in another yeah. direction. Yeah, if I could if I could sing Bad Company like he does. Oh my gosh. That's all I do. It's unbelievable how great those some of those guys' vocals are. And even today, man, I've seen some stuff on Access TV recently with Bad Company and they still the guy still sings this. Well, tail. you know, that's that's a little bit of a thing about country music too is you can get by without being the greatest vocalist in the world. I'm proof of it. If you tell if you're singing out something that's relatable enough and people are getting that message from it, you know. I mean, so. even got like Christopherson, man. Christopherson's not a great career. He's not a great singer. Oh, well, no doubt. He's a man. prolific songwriter. I mean, no just having the ability to, to to paint pictures with words and be able to connect with that audience like that is a very powerful tool. And when it's coming from someplace really personal and you can really connect with that listener, that's that's magic, man. Yeah, and it also makes it a lot more fun to play. You don't get tired of playing those songs. Oh, absolutely. You know? I, I'll never forget I wrote with uh Charles Kelly, Lady A, and uh, maybe Dallas Davidson, I think. And we sat in there, and we wrote this song, and Charles was kind of singing it as we went. And I'm like, God, this is awesome. You know, this, this is a great song. And we got home, and I, I went to play it, and I was like, this song's horrible. But you he sang so well. It was an awesome song. So like when he sang, when I sang, it sounded awful. You know, like it didn't have anything. So I think that's it. Is I, I, never, I knew I wasn't the greatest singer in the world, so I try to write stuff that really, like— you know, but, but you all, every song has a home. Sometimes a song is not meant for for a certain artist, and it might lay around for a while, and it might go really fast. But you know, it's finding the right things that fit you and yeah. what you want to say. That, that's you want to connect that's something that I I'm, I don't have a real production oriented mind. You know, I'm kind of just I know it sounds good, and I know kind of what I like. But uh, I've struggled with that with some outside songs. Of going like, man, I love the song. But I, I well, can't do it. Yeah. I, I told a songwriter this several years ago because he did amazing demos, great singer, uh, just really prolific songwriter. And, and I told him, I said, I got to really be careful when I'm listening to your demos. You'll sell me a bad song because he sang so good <laughs> and he didn't quite know how to take it. It's like, I mean, that's really a compliment, <laughs> you know, because you, you sing so good that all the little phrases and nuances that you put in sometimes can't be recreated. So we were talking a, a little bit ago. Tell me about these cars. You have this this random thing that you do about just picking up yeah. you know, cars and, and traipsing across the country. Yeah, I've just always liked old cars. You know, my first vehicle was a 1968 Ford Bronco, and I I think I, think I tiled somebody's bathroom and gave them like $1,000 for it, you know, and I fixed it up a little bit. And I think it sold it for like three grand and then uh, bought it back for like seven. And, you know, and I just, it was, it was always something cool to me about, you know, that old smell of old vehicle and, you know, driving, I still have three or four cars that are manual transmission out of this and people don't even know how to drive those anymore. I don't think, but, uh, I, I got in when I was on the road, I'd start looking at Facebook marketplace and Craigslist and finding old cars. And I bought one, uh, this, I still have this, uh, Chrysler LeBaron. It's got wood panel siding on it. It's the ugliest car you, you've ever seen. Like you can see the front tire through the rust hole in the floorboard. If it's, if it's raining or the ground's wet and you turn, your leg gets wet. You know what I mean? Wow. But it's awesome. And it's like a head turner. People are like just like fist pumping you down the road. But it broke down the day I bought it when I was on tour with Brad Paisley. And we had to push it out of the way and leave it there and get it hauled back. And uh, I've recently started buying stuff that's a little nicer. You know, it's, it's uh, but it, I mean, I've, I've made a little money doing this kind of a side gig. And I just like drive something for a little while and I'll sell it and try to find something else. And What's your dream car? Well, that's tough. Yeah. Uh, I had a 1987 Chevy square body and it was blue with a silver stripe on it and I sold it. I And and I think I played a gig and gave like eight grand for this thing at the time. This was when I didn't have any money. So I, you know, it was, it was a nice truck and I was about to build a house. This is way before my record deal and a guy came by and offered me 12 for it and I was like, do it quick, you know, get out of here for a change of mind. Sold it and I begged him to sell it back and couldn't but I've since bought a red 87 same truck and i got it painted that same paint scheme and it's got tan interior and it's like that's that's the one i just i go out and look at it all the time 
you know. No, they had a completely different ride back then, too. I, I remember. Oh, yeah. Well, the seats are so you just bouncing down the road. Just the old bench seat, man. Yeah, Everything's man. come such a long way. I remember the first time my dad got a pickup truck with electric windows in it, and he griped about it all the time. You don't need all this mess on here. It's just more stuff to break. You ought to have to be able to roll your window down. I mean, it's like, that was that was a huge transition, getting electric windows and doors oh, I, in a pickup truck, man. I think, <laughs> I think I can remember standing on the bench seat, like, you know, my dad driving and have a hole rusted in the floorboard of him spitting. <laughs> when we were driving, just and you it, had to roll just reach across like that when yeah. you came to a stop. Yeah, just I said right there. Yeah, yeah. but it was. Uh, I, I always look at it like you know they got the new Broncos out now. You know, and and my things like if you get the newest whatever, the newest Mercedes, the next year somebody's gonna have the newer one. Yeah. But that never goes that style. That old like square bodies or old Mustangs or, or Broncos, whatever it is. I just I don't ever get tired of that. My dream car is a '69 Chevelle SS. That's at some point. That's one of the things I'm. Going the window to. for finding one of those in a barn that nobody knows they had is over. Oh my gosh! Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of fun to watch that too. Is what I've seen is. Obviously, the Broncos, the old small body Broncos, being, are outrageous. Uh, well, the old one being able to take the back off of that Bronco was a really oh, cool yeah, thing, yeah. man. But what I've seen is like obviously they're outrageously high, and cars are starting to go up. But what the trend is like, whatever truck the the age group that's like you know I would say in their early thirties, like maybe have a family, starting to make a little money with the career, whatever their dad drove, that's the truck that gets starts to get, and it kind of follows that. Like right now. Those like early mid nineties Z seventy one, just single cab trucks. Like those are about to take off. I'm telling you, if you can find one of those, buy it, and I'll buy it from you. I tell you, if you if you get to look, and I've got a buddy that has a uh, that rolls through a lot of old classic cars here in yeah. this area, man. He's he's finding stuff all the time. He has the Ford dealership up in Lebanon, so he's he's rolling through all these old cars. He's kind of really big into it, and he's into the big jacked up. He he'll he'll take a, a pickup truck and make it look like a semi. That's oh what, yeah, he's one of those guys. Yeah, that that kind of stuff. I, I've I've realized that a lot of my influence and style and things that I thought were cool were whatever my sister's boyfriend did. That was what I thought was cool. Like, whatever he dipped or listened to uh, and whatever kind of truck he drove, how he dressed, that was what I thought was cool for a while. And then I realized now he's a regular old guy with kids. He's a nerd. But at the time, I thought that you were cool if you were my have, sister's boyfriend. Have you had a chance to play one of these uh, mud parks and stuff yet? You know, where everybody comes <laughs> the weekend. Dude, those are insane. Oh, yeah. We did one in Kentucky. We did one. Uh, I mean, I'm, years ago, when I was just still touring, playing acoustic shows myself, I don't know that there's a type of venue I haven't played. Yeah. But, but yeah, man, there was a... Uh, it was a wonder if people didn't get killed out there. It really is. I mean, just drinking it's all wide day open and open all weekend. I, but this is a dumb question. But can you drink like on private property? Can you just drink and ride around on a side by side? Hell yeah! I mean, I know you can. I, just, <laughs> I mean, well, like, yeah, but that's kind of a. I think, it's kind of risque to think about. These guys are just hammering beers all day and I think one of these just, steep banks. And I think you have to sign the disclaimer when you come in. Yeah, I think you have to. As long as you don't put it on the highway, it's totally legal. It'll be fine. I, you know, I think redneck. That sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> that, there was a uh, there was one I played that was like it wasn't the like razors. It was like the rock crawler. Yeah. And I mean, there were guys coming into town that we have a place like that in Jacksonville, Alabama. And there was, there was guys coming in with like low boy trailers that were probably like sixty thousand dollar trailers like big hundred thousand dollar trucks and three or four of like hundred thousand dollar vehicles that's what i'm saying and then they would just go beat the hell out of them on the side of the mountain you know what's that place in louisiana uh the the mud bog yeah we played it outside of spring hill that was the last one we did and it was still kind of cold but that's 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 one of those places people are insane down i mean it's a bunch of red cajun rednecks is all it is and Mm -hmm. they, they had these side by sides with speakers just crammed all over them just had it jacked up everybody drunker in hell got moonshine and it's 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 insane time. i know you dealt with this mine was always somebody but like, man come on jump on a ride with me oh, whatever yeah, and yeah. get on there and they'd be blaring your song on there it's so uncomfortable oh my gosh <laughs> I, I had a buddy down in orange beach that used to take me out on his boat all the time and, and i would just hey man don't don't play and, me, and, but he, sure enough he had loud speakers big tri-tune he just blare it out yeah it's embarrassing everywhere <laughs> i go i hear paint me a birmingham man. Yeah. I'm just like, oh i'm sure jesus christ guys i get it i appreciate it but come Man, really? Well, well, it's do they don't get it that it's like people on other boats are going, oh, there's Tracy Lawrence, listen to his whole music. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty creepy. <laughs> Tracy Lawrence's guitar picker, head paint on, paint on, paint me a Birmingham on there. It's like Jesus, come on, man. <laughs> Brother, it's been good getting to know you, getting caught up, and uh, I hope we get a chance to play a lot of shows together in the very near future. Yeah, I man, that'd be great. Have a good time out on the road. If we don't, we'll golf or, or shoot something. I'm sure we'll find something to do. You're going to work a lot this year, I'm sure. Yeah, I, we're, we're going to play a bunch of shows, and it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad to be back out. Website? 
uh, RileyGreenMusic.com, uh, Instagrams, Riley Duckman. I think that's about everything else. Riley Duckman. So they can find me. Enjoy it, my friend. Appreciate it. Man. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you.